Every day, we live our life built on habits. In a lot of ways, your life today will be the sum of your habits. According to researchers, habits will account for at least 40% of your behaviors today, probably more, maybe closer to 90%. And so often the key to making a change in your life comes down to changing your habits, which takes work and commitment and a plan, but change is often possible. Well, right now on Discover the Word, Daniel Ryan Day is leading Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry in a series about spiritual habits and training. They're talking about how some of our habits train us in righteousness and godliness and lead to a life that looks like Jesus. Other habits train us in greed or some other form of brokenness that leads us into self-destructive patterns for ourselves and for others. And so what are you training yourself in? What are the habits that you're living into and what kind of person is that making you become? Well, I hope you'll think about that with us as we begin part two of our study called Spiritual Habits and Training here on Discover the Word. And you know, there are tons of habits that we are not concerned with in this series, but the activities we are concerned with are those that train us in godliness. That's a term we found the Apostle Paul use in his first letter to Timothy last week. And it forms the foundation for why we're doing this series about spiritual habits and training on the Discover the Word podcast. Well, Daniel has another passage he wants to take us to to begin part two of this series that will build on that First Timothy foundation. And then throughout the week, we're going to talk about some specific activities, often called spiritual disciplines, that can contribute to training us in godliness. Disciplines found in scripture that have been used in various forms throughout the history of the church. All right, so let's pull our chairs up to the table with Daniel and Elisa and Bill and Rasul and continue this conversation about spiritual habits and training. So beginning of last week, I introduced you to a new Greek word, Gym, gym, <laughs> something to do with gymnasium. There you go. <laughs> That's That's gymnazo. <laughs> yep, gymnazo, which reminded us of the gymnasium or gymnastics or whatever. And in Greek, what does it mean? Exercise naked. And why, Bill? Do you want to give some context? Well, because that's how athletes competed in the Greek games in the ancient Olympics and Isthmian games. The Must athletes, have made more sense. They didn't have to wash their clothes. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, and you think about the statuary and stuff from that right. time where the human body was not something to hide mm-hmm. in those cultures necessarily. And even still to this day, even though we don't go that far, like there is a sense where yeah. you want to wear stuff that's not going to catch or that you mm-hmm. can have yeah. freedom of movement. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, exactly. And Paul references physical training. Mm-hmm. in the passage we looked at in 1 Timothy 4. But we didn't really focus on that part. What did we f- focus on in that first conversation? Train in what? Godliness, Yeah, yeah. Right. which is still a little beyond us, but we can grow, he can grow his characteristics in us. Yeah, and it takes being intentional. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I have a personal trainer. They ask me first what my goals are. Okay, you wanna lose some weight, you wanna gain some muscle. This is the routine, you yeah. know, that you do to get this goal. If you wanna have greater endurance, you need to do some cardio. If you need to have some greater strength, you need to do some weight training. Mm-hmm. So all of those things point toward whatever your goal is of the objective of the training. Yeah, and so for Paul, train yourself in godliness. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only time that that word shows up. There's a few others. So I thought it could be fun for us to look at some other places. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter five. Could someone read verses 12 through 14 and listen for the word training or trained? Okay, You'll see it, I think. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Did you see the word in there? Trained by practice. Yeah. And what's being trained? Discernment. Yeah. There's discernment. Yep. It's Distinguishing definitely a between about. good and evil. Yep. He's contrasting it to being unskilled in the word of righteousness. Yeah. And so the idea there is that what's being compared and contrasted here is there's one group who has been around... Christianity for a while now, been around the church for a while now, and they should be able to clearly communicate 
what this whole thing is about. And specifically, the book of Hebrews has a really primary idea that it emphasizes over and over again throughout the whole book, which is Jesus is the son of God. He's superior to any prophet, teacher, priest that came before him. So he's it. Everything's coming to tell us about Jesus, to introduce us to Jesus. Jesus is the thing. And so it seems like maybe the author at this point is like, look, at this point, you should know this piece. Yeah. Mm. Right? We've talked about this before. You should get it, but you're not getting it. So I'm going to give you some more milk yeah. instead of solid food. And that's being compared to those who have trained their faculties, their abilities, their understanding yeah. themselves okay. to be able to distinguish what? Good from evil. So something about that milk, the struggle that these people are having to get their minds around what's really going on in this story is keeping them from not being able to distinguish good and evil. And then there's another group that have been trained, they've practiced, they've thought about this thing. Mm. And as a result, they're able to distinguish between good and evil, which obviously we can only do through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, Daniel, when he talks about they should have progressed to a further point than where they are. Uh, We don't know how long they had been in the faith. We don't know how much opportunity or teaching they had had. We know they didn't have a Bible, as we think of the term Bible. But apparently, in the author's opinion, they had access to enough that they should have progressed further than they are. Yeah, and if we move on to Hebrews 12, we'll see that described because the author goes on to describe those in verse 7 of chapter 12 in Hebrews of those who have endured trials for the sake of discipline. Mm -hmm. Interesting word there, endured trials for the sake of discipline, and then uses the metaphor of parents disciplining their children to shape them into mature adults. Mm -hmm. And then we get to verses 10 and 11 of chapter 12. Maybe, Elisa, you could read that for us. Sure. They disciplined us for a little while, our parents, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. True that. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Mm, did you see the word trained? Mm-hmm. So there it is again. Mm-hmm. Our, and, our discipline. and discipline. Yeah. And discipline. It's interesting. It goes on in verse 12 about, therefore, strengthen your feeble knees, your, you know, mm-hmm. and make level paths and all that. It makes me think about throwing off the clothes we were yeah. talking about, you know, give rid of any encumbrance so that you can run the race. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know about you, but in the kind of way that I've grown up in understanding what Christianity is, it surprises me to see so much language about training, about discipline, yeah. about practice, because so much of the gospel is about what God has done for us mm-hmm. and in us. But there's this other side to it of the responsibilities that we have to really lean into this. Yeah, and not in any way discounting the fact that it's God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. But we have a responsibility, again, to participate with him in that work of growing us. And as we're discovering together, Daniel, as you're leading us, we're finding that this idea is not a one-off. I mean, it mm-hmm. is all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's specifically important, and I find this very practical concern and consideration serving in pastoral ministry mm-hmm. at a time where there's so much counterfeit mm-hmm. uh, teaching about God and about spiritual reality to see that there's this insight about discernment that is closely related to the discipline of staying Mm -hmm. adept and into God's word. And I think specifically about the idea of how the FBI trains their people to spot counterfeit money. It's by (laughs) them studying actual money like as closely as possible so they can pick out a counterfeit. They don't just look and study the counterfeits. They mostly study the actual. And in the same way, I think the writer of Hebrews is trying to help this group of believers saying, if you want to avoid getting caught up in counterfeit teaching, if you want to avoid those things, study and develop Mm -hmm. that sense of discernment. So then as soon as you see something that's off, you can spot it immediately. And discernment is another spiritual practice that the Mm -hmm. church has passed down to Mm -hmm. us from passages like this. Mm -hmm. And part of the discipline and the practice that the author of the Hebrews is pointing us toward is for this fruit of righteousness. And he kind of references two of what those are in verses 14 and 15, where he talks about pursue peace Mm -hmm. with everyone, 
See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. So there's this sense in which these disciplines and these practices lead somewhere, mm. right, toward the way that we serve and care for others, yeah. like pursuing peace with everyone. Well, all along I've been thinking about godliness as really the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, mm -hmm. it's those qualities we possess when we look like God, and He grows them in us. You know, we can't develop them. So as yeah. much as we train, we're participating in His growth in us, his own growth of his character in us. Yeah. And that's so key because I think one of the counterfeits is not just about bad teaching, but it's also a practice of increasingly incivility, increasingly yeah. just meanness mm -hmm. or this kind of the polarization of our politics mm -hmm. entering into Christian spaces. And now we attack each other. And so I think that becomes part of the discernment in the practice to say, nah, that's not authentic. Yeah. The authentic version of this mm. faith is love, is fellowship, is communion with each other as well. Yeah, and practicing peace, actually right. trying to live at peace right. with yeah. one another. Um, we need to look at just one more passage because there's one more use of the word train. And it's kind of important because it shows that we can train in the opposite way. Two. So if someone could read Second Peter 2, verse 14. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Well, that's a nice little yeah. verse yeah. to read. My translation says, not that they're experts in greed, but they have hearts trained in greed. They've trained in greed. And that might be a good question for all of us to carry mm. with us out of this conversation is, how do you train yourself in greed? Ooh. And the fact that all of this training that we're talking about, all of this intentional practice has an, another side too. Because mm -hmm. everything we do is trained by habits and the habits that we lean into. And some of those can form us for the better. Yeah. And some of those can form us in not so good ways. And so what are we training ourselves in? What are the habits that we're leaning into? What kind of people are we becoming because of the way that we are training? Yeah, good questions. And uh, we would do well to take an inventory from time to time, evaluating habits that we've developed that are shaping the way that we're living and the kind of person we're becoming. And that's hopefully going to be the value of this study that Daniel and Elisa and Bill and Rasul are doing here on the Discover the Word podcast. And we'll have some practices, some disciplines that can become habits that will infuse life and health into our relationship with God and with others. And so in this next segment, we're going to talk about probably the most obvious spiritual practice that we would encourage you to make into a habit. This ministry began as Radio Bible Class over 85 years ago. Our stated mission is to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. Uh, we want to fuel a global Bible engagement movement. And so I think a key spiritual habit that we want to encourage you to develop has something to do, at least, with the Bible. In a series about biblical spiritual habits that have been passed down to us for generations in the church, I thought maybe, since we're on Discover the Word, a part of our Daily Bread Ministries, <laughs> maybe we should talk about Bible reading Ooh. as well. well <laughs> because that, that? Well, that is uh, really, if you think so about it, counterintuitive. There's, <laughs> there's two practices that most people think about, especially in evangelical circles, yeah. prayer and Bible reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more to that, which I hope is what comes out of this series is for us to realize how many other ways we can lean intentionally into our faith. But we don't want to devalue or neglect one of the most important, which is engaging with the scriptures. And I agree with you 100%. And I also know that the people in the Bible times didn't have a Bible. That's right. That's true. Yeah, and not everybody has a journal and pen at that time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like you could write down things or something like that, which will be important for us to talk about after so this first passage. Yeah. This is an oral culture, yeah. right, at a time exactly. where ideas are being passed down through memory and things like that. But I was just curious, am I the only one at this table who has found the Bible at times to be life-giving, but at other times 
not life-giving. The time in my life when the Bible was least life-giving to me was my first semester in Bible college. We had a class in Old Testament survey, and we were told at the beginning of the semester that we had to be able to truthfully say on the final exam, I have read through the entire Old Uh, Testament. uh. And the night before the test, you'd see all these students just laying around in hallways Uh. and in porches and stuff, and they're all just cramming, turning pages like crazy, trying to get through the whole Old Testament so they can answer that question. And that was not particularly (laughs) life-giving at that moment, Daniel. Yeah, I think at times when it's felt, honestly, more just from a vocational standpoint, you know, like, uh, what's the next Bible study I got to teach? What's the next sermon Mm -hmm. I got to give? What's the next Mm -hmm. Discover the Word series I need to lead? (laughs) Um, Maintaining, even though I love doing those things, Maintaining a sense of a a personal connection Mm -hmm. and devotional life while you are also leading and preparing for Mm -hmm. public consumption. When that gets out of whack, that's when it can feel Mm -hmm. tedious. Mm -hmm. Honest. Yeah. I think for me, I didn't grow up in a conservative environment. We didn't really ever read our Bible, so <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't overwhelming to me. But I can, I mean, and I love reading the Bible. And almost every single time I read, I sense and hear God speaking. So it's awesome. But I get overwhelmed in a different way, and then I don't understand stuff, mm-hmm. and I get very down on myself. And why can't I remember the flow of the arc of Scripture? And we'll be in here at the table going through stuff, and I'm like, oh. I forgot that part. And then that feels very overwhelming to yeah. keep it at my fingertips. And yeah, present. I agree, Lisa. I also think about the sections of the Bible that sometimes we get into. So-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. And he was the father of so-and-so who begot so-and-so and begot so-and-so. And you're mm-hmm. just like, so? I don't care. Mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> and I know I should care. Yeah, and there's and a I know I should know it. all these names and I know there's meaning yeah. here, but I can't don't access care. It. <laughs> and why do we have a burnt offering? Why do we have a sin offering? And why does mm-hmm. it have to be uh, you know, a horned hoof and oh my goodness. A grain offering yep. and mm-hmm. a drink offering. And so I want us to think about the question, what makes Bible reading a spiritual practice? Not reading those we, sections. <laughs> yeah, that's right. As we go through. Yeah. And the first passage we're going to read originally would have been passed around without any physical copy of it. So let's read Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 12. And I think we'll begin to see how this might be a spiritual practice, at least maybe what some of the purpose of reading the scriptures could be for us. So if somebody could start that for us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you a land with fine, large cities that you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and groves that you did not plant. And when you have eaten your fill, take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Yeah, so when Israel heard these words, did the Bible exist yet? No. No. Okay, so what are the words that God wanted Israel to keep before them? The Shema, Mm -hmm. the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And was he talking just about that or was it about everything that was all the instructions? Yeah, keep the words that I am commanding you today. Yeah, Deuteronomy means second law. You know, we often talk about what's the context of a passage. Well, the context of Deuteronomy is after the 40 years in the wilderness, a whole generation has died off. Well, it just so happens that that was the generation that agreed to the law at Mount Sinai. Mm that committed themselves to obey it. So before the people, the new generation goes into the promised land, Moses rehearses all of that law with them so that they can make their own commitment to it Mm. rather Mm -hmm. than just resting in their ancestors' commitment. Mm. So God is inviting them to keep everything Moses commanded to them, everything God had communicated to Moses, which mostly becomes what we call the instruction or the Torah, the Deuteronomy being part of that Torah. And how are they supposed to remember those words? What are some of the practical things? Well, I was struck by that because 
they didn't have paper like we do, mm-hmm. but it's, they're told to write it down, mm-hmm. you know, to bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, write them on the doorpost of your home and on your gates. That's the practice of phylacteries. And mm-hmm. travel to Israel or into a Jewish community, you'll see Orthodox Jews with a leather strap wrapped around their arm and then on the top of their hand will be a little leather box and that contains the Shema in it. Mm -hmm. And they would do the same thing on their foreheads and on the doorposts of their house. They would have a little, and I'm not remembering what the name of it is, a little container Mm -hmm. that would contain the Shema. And every time they would enter or leave the house, they would stop and kiss their hand and touch that. Yeah, those are in my neighborhood. Cause I, mm-hmm. you know, and so I see, you know, I can tell when I'm in at a Jewish person's door cause they have the, that part, that container you're talking yeah. about that gets touched, uh, on the way in. So that's still a practice that is done today. Yeah. There's also recite these things. Mm-hmm. So in order to recite something, you have to, you memorize, have, you have it. to memorize it. So reciting, memorizing, talk about it. Mm-hmm. That's one way that we engage with the scriptures and practice Bible reading is talking about it together. It's really practical, actually, what Moses goes on to to encourage them. But what's the primary reason? It comes at the end of this section for remembering all these things, doing all these things. To not forget God and his redemption out of slavery. Yeah. Don't forget the Lord who rescued them from slavery in Egypt. So notice it's not just so that they do the right things or behave the right way, all of that's included in the instruction in Torah. The real point of this is don't forget the story. Don't forget what God has done for you. He rescued you out of Egypt. So main idea, I think, from this one is Bible is about remembering and passing down stories about God. But I think we should look at a couple other passages quickly as well. What about Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11? How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commands. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. In Psalm 119, what does the word typically refer to, that phrase, the word? Well, in context, it refers to the Torah. Yeah. But we usually kind of extrapolate it to mean the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the Bible still doesn't quite exist yet in the way that we're used to it at this point. And so how does a young man keep their way pure by keeping the Torah, the instruction ever before them is kind of what's happening there. So it's a story with that first section and this section, there's some instructions, some keeping. And even in the instruction, I think the thread that I see both with Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 119 is this relationship. Like we talk, remember the Lord Mm -hmm. your God. And then here, of course, in Psalm 119, it's very much a love song about the word. And so I think when we think about Bible reading is spiritual practice, making sure that is this a process or is this an activity or is this a practice that is drawing me closer to the heart of God yeah. and not just the accumulation of knowledge yeah. about God. And I think a great example of that is Psalm 19 verses 7 through 11, if somebody could read that. And I think you'll really sense what the heart of why do we focus so much on this, why is it a healthy spiritual practice for us? The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Mm. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Mm. The commands of the Lord are radiant, mm. giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. That's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, refreshing, reviving the soul, giving us wisdom, joy, enlightening our eyes so we can see better. These are so good. that it tastes even sweeter than honey. I like how he uses all our senses. Yeah, right. To understand that, yeah. Yep. And so when we think about Bible reading or engaging the Bible as a spiritual practice, the heart of it is remembering what God has done. It's living these things out in our lives, right? But ultimately, of course, it's not the Bible itself that's the thing that has all of those benefits. It's the God who is found in the pages of the Bible and the relationship we have with him in which we truly find our souls refreshed and the invitation to follow him. Yeah, Bible reading 
as a spiritual habit. Uh, We emphasize that a lot because we know that the more we engage the scriptures, the more our relationship with God shapes how we think and how we live. And you know, there's a phrase that I remember Marte Hahn, another longtime member of our Discover the Word group using, that we read for relationship. That's what Daniel was stressing there at the end. The aim of making this a habit is drawing us into closer relationship with God. Read for relationship. Well, next, we're going to talk about another spiritual discipline that can have a positive impact on our spiritual life. It's a common one, mentioned often in Scripture, emphasized down through the history of the church. But when you bring it up, I mean, the reaction is often mixed and fairly polarized. Some are committed to its value, and others, they don't have much use for it. It's actually kind of strange. And so what is it? And what spiritual muscles will this discipline exercise? And how will this practice enhance our spiritual health and wellness? Well, we will find out in just a moment. Now, for podcast listeners to discover the Word, uh, we have a bonus conversation for you right now that I had with Daniel about why spiritual habits and training is so important to him. Uh, Daniel also leads an aspect of Our Daily Bread Ministries called Reclaim Today, which is aimed at engaging Gen Z and millennials, you know, those right now in their 20s and 30s, and helping them to live out their faith in Christ with their questions and their life situations. And one of the key ways they found to be most effective is focusing on spiritual habits, disciplines, practices. ReclaimToday.org is their website. And uh, so here's a conversation I had with Daniel about Reclaim Today and kind of the why behind these Discover the Word conversations that we're having. Well, Daniel, in this series, we're talking a lot about habits. Just talked about the uh, habit of reading the Bible, how mm-hmm. important that is. Yeah. But why are habits so important in your mind? Yeah. Can I give you a little uh, behind the scenes information Let's here about it. why I care about this so much? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we've kind of learned more about how we become who we become, mm-hmm. one of the things that my team has learned is that a lot of that has to do with four C's. Okay, so I'm going to give you the four C's of how we become who we become. The first is content. Okay. So think truth, think the stories that we hear, think the way that content shapes us okay. into who we become. Okay. So the lessons that we learn, the things that we learn, the things we internalize, all of that. Okay. Okay, content. Content, information. Information. Yeah. Right, okay. Yep. The second C is your context. So where you live. So the city you live in, the community you live in, the neighborhood you live in, the church you go to, the types of stores that you visit, the restaurants that you go to, all of those things are our context. It's where we live every day. Mm -hmm. And that shapes us to value certain things, to care about certain things. Just think about sports, right? Typically, people who grow up in a certain city follow those (laughs) those sports teams And do they do that kindly or pretty aggressively sometimes, Brian? Uh, On a pretty (laughs) aggressive basis, yeah. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So it shapes you, right? The context where you live. Yeah, our stories are different stories if they take place in a different context. That's right. So content, context, and then we have conduct. Conduct is how we live. Mm -hmm. So the information we have, content, the context where we live, conduct how we live in the spaces that we live. So these are the habits, the things that we do every day, sometimes without even thinking about them. And our conduct, what we do, how we do it, how we care for others, how we not care for others, those types of things also shape us into who we become. And we have control over that more than we think we do, don't we? Exactly. But sometimes when we're not intentional in our conduct and how we live, then we fall into unintentional habits there's still things that come in and fill the void, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't brush your teeth, you do something else with those two minutes. Right. And, <laughs> and not brush your teeth. That's a, that's a habit. That's well. a habit, right. And it has consequences too. Yep. And so it's the most simple little thing in our lives, but it has it could have big consequences one way or the other, right? right? So our conduct, the way that we live every day. Uh, and then the fourth C is community. So the people that we're around. Mm-hmm. 
And right, my mom's been telling me this my whole life. You become who you hang out with. Right. Yep. <laughs> it's a great predictor of your future is see who your friends are today. Yep. And so th- those are the that's the background of why I'm so passionate about spiritual formation and spiritual discipline and habits. And it's the reason that my team at Reclaim Today has put so much behind reclaimtoday.org slash habits, where you can learn about what does it look like to intentionally lean into those four C's of content context, conduct, and community so that we become more like Jesus. Yeah, well, thanks, Daniel. That was helpful. And so, again, where can we go to take advantage of how Reclaim Today might be useful for us or for someone we know in that age range that you target? Yeah, reclaimtoday.org slash habits, and right away you'll see a two-minute introduction video that will give you a picture of the whole thing. Great. Thanks again. So is fasting good for you? There seems to have been a lot of study done recently that has investigated the benefits and the dangers of fasting. You hear a lot about intermittent fasting and fasting for health reasons. Fasting seems to have benefit for heart health, be a way to control blood sugar, reduce inflammation, and possibly improve conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, asthma, MS, and stroke. Well, next, they're going to talk about fasting but not because there may be physical health benefits to the practice. They're going to talk about fasting as a spiritual practice. Are there spiritual benefits associated with fasting? So when we talk about biblical spiritual habits and disciplines, we talked about prayer, talked about Bible reading. What's the other one that people typically think of when it comes to church attendance church attendance (laughs) which is kind of one we talked about that a little bit in the friendship conversation right that we need to be tied to community fasting fasting there we go so each of us has talked about what our biggest maybe practices that we struggle with the most if i can just be honest i just don't even like this one (laughs) (laughs) fasting is definitely my least favorite it's the one i avoid the most going without food intentionally. I don't know why I would want to do that, but I think there's some really good reasons for that, but we'll talk about it in a minute. And I think part of it shows how I grew up and the denominations that I have Mm -hmm. been a part of, because Mm -hmm. for some denominations, you fast all the time. It's Mm -hmm. just a part of that Mm -hmm. church community. Other religions have fasting where people just, that's what you do. So Mm -hmm. for us, I think maybe in certain denominations that we've been a part of, fasting seems harder, maybe even unnecessary at times. What are some of the reasons that people fast? The one that's made sense to me is not eating in order to focus more on God. So like during the time I would typically eat and when I feel the pangs of hunger, I'm reminded to focus in on God. Mm -hmm. what I long for in him, what he wants to give to me, and so that that nourishment takes the place of physical nourishment of food. I've appreciated the tradition of Lent as a Mm -hmm. kind of season that is looking toward the suffering and, and, and reflecting on the suffering of Christ and looking forward to Good Friday and even refraining from or fasting from something for that season and Definitely, you know, as I want to think about the suffering of Christ on Good Friday, that's been something I've Mm. done in the past just Mm to be more aware of that sense of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't have a strong history of fasting except recently when I was forced to because of a medical procedure Mm -hmm. I was getting ready to have. And I was on a forced liquid diet for like 48 hours before the surgery and it was terrible. (laughs) I hated it. (laughs) And that's the other side of fasting that we sometimes don't think about is there's non-religious reasons to fast, Mm. right? Some people have to do it for in preparation for a surgery, intermittent fasting that a lot of health people talk about. And some people can't fast physically, you know, if they're hypoglycemic or diabetic Mm -hmm. or, you know, fasting is dangerous. And I think that's a heavy one because you're like, well, you know, how am I going to participate in this spiritual discipline when I'll faint? Yeah. And then there's people that are going through suffering or pain or someone's died. 
and a part of the mourning process for them is fasting, Mm -hmm. or they're really desperate for healing or for someone that they care about for something to happen. So they fast because they just really want God to know, like, this is a really big deal. Can Mm. you please help me with this? So let's take all of that with us into a passage that we started to look at in our conversation on prayer, because Jesus also talks about fasting and giving in that section as well. So this is Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, if somebody could read that for us. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like (laughs) hypocrites, for they disfigure their heads so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Mm. What was kind of the the big warning that Jesus gives right at the beginning of this chapter? Don't do stuff to be seen by people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's not wrong for people to necessarily see you do it, but don't let that be your motive Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try and impress. What are some of the ways that we see in the passage we read trying to draw attention? Praying really loudly Mm -hmm. and with fancy words and maybe a different tone of voice than Mm -hmm. normal. Yep. And related to fasting. Looking dismal and Mm -hmm. having a facial expression (laughs) that shows you're in just utter misery, which I can relate to. Yep. (laughs) If we look at the rest of this section, we see some hints to the purpose of fasting. So there's the warning, don't do it this way, but there's also a description of why this might be helpful that Jesus goes into. For example, verses 19 through 21, which we don't often think about tied to fasting and prayer and giving, but it is, it's tied to this whole line of thought that Jesus is teaching. So could someone read verses 19 through 21? Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah. And maybe verse 24, Bill, could you read that for us? Sure. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or riches. Yeah. So in this line of thinking and development that Jesus is doing as he's teaching, we see that fasting is somehow related to treasure. The way we practice fasting is related to maybe how we hold the treasures and the things of the world. Something about fasting helps us not be a slave to money and wealth. And then it continues. Could someone read verses 25 through 34? Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Did you hear any references to food in there? Yeah, what will we eat? What will we drink? And the Mm -hmm. Father knows you need these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any examples of God feeding anything in this passage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The birds of the air Mm -hmm. who don't sow or reap, but God feeds them. Yep. What might be the connection between an invitation to fast, but fast not just for outward appearances and worry? I think maybe gratitude Mm -hmm. and maybe focus. I was thinking a little bit earlier in our conversation that... Fasting is a way to wean us off of temptations. Mm -hmm. But in this culture, as Jesus spoke to it, what you eat, what you drink, 
what you wear. <laughs> those are essentials. Mm -hmm. Those are not luxuries. And for us, it's like another pair of black shoes. Or for us, it's another strawberry shortcake. I think that's interesting. Is, is that intended, do you think, the freedom of temptation? I think it's definitely there. But I think, what is the temptation that we're being freed of? If there's one way that we typically approach food and clothing and things. It's, this is what I do for myself. Mm, that's true. I think one that's of the true. themes we've seen repeatedly through this whole series of conversations is that spiritual disciplines, as we've been discussing them, in part are there to remind us of our reliance upon God and his spirit. Yeah, and fasting is a great example of that one. Yeah, and I also think it's related to this reminder of the fact that the physical world and our physical needs don't tell the whole story of who we are. And sometimes if we're satisfied with all the things that we could possibly eat and see around us, we can become forgetful of the fact that this is not all of what I need. I think about hmm. when the first temptation of Jesus, right? He fasts for 40 days and the first temptation that the enemy offers is if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Yeah. And his response is, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so this reminder of like, it's not just about meeting my physical needs, but ultimately my true mm. deeper need is spiritual, mm. I think is helped along through the process of fasting. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't devalue our physical mm -mm. needs, but it reminds us that there's more going on than just the physical world that we live in. And so something about fasting at its core reminds us that there's more to life than food, or buying more things, or building wealth, or retirement, or whatever. Something about fasting kind of disconnects us from the normal way that we go through life and reminds us that something more is happening. Um, it also, throughout church history, has been a way that people have stood in solidarity with the poor. Hmm. So to remind themselves physically that there are people in other places Mm -hmm. that don't have access to the food that they have access to. It does increase compassion mm -hmm. there. Also throughout the Bible, we see fasting often tied to repentance. Uh, and we specifically, probably the clearest example of that is in Jonah, where hmm. the king says, don't just put sackcloth on the people, but also on all the animals <laughs> to repent to the Lord. It's also connected to grief and mourning, like in Second Samuel. But there's also one last piece. And this is that fasting is also connected to pointing us toward eternity when all needs for all people and all times will be met in mm. Christ. And we see Jesus kind of hint at that in Mark 2 verses 18 through 20, where he's actually being critiqued because it's a normal time for people to fast. And John the Baptist disciples are fasting and the Pharisees are fasting. And they come and say, well, why aren't you and your disciples fasting. And Jesus says, well, the bridegroom's with them right now. But there is a time coming when the bridegroom won't be with them, and that'll be the time for them to fast. And so part of the invitation for us in fasting is also to connect ourselves with the anticipation, the longing that we have for God to make all things right. And I think that's a pretty beautiful reason to fast. I know I keep saying this, but we're in a series talking about spiritual habits and disciplines that we find in the scriptures and that have been passed down to us throughout church history for the purpose of training in godliness is what Paul invited Timothy to think about. What does it mean to train in godliness? It doesn't, we're not talking about earning our salvation. We're not talking about trying to keep God happy so that he'll love us. In fact, all of this is only possible through the Holy Spirit, but there are these intentional ways that we can lean into our faith and it develops us into becoming a certain type of person who's hopefully godly. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next one we're going to lean into is one that people might get a little antsy about. What do you picture when I say confession? Depends on the context. <laughs> okay. In the legal system, a confession is when somebody admits to having committed a crime and submits themselves to the justice system to get it all sorted out. In the spiritual realm, it's used a variety of ways, but I think the way that I'm most familiar with is First John 1, 9. If we confess mm -hmm. our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us mm 
of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's a challenging thing. Why don't you read 1 John 1, 9 through 2, 2. There's a little bit more to that passage okay. that I think might be helpful in relation to confession. And okay. since you already mentioned it, and yeah. I was thinking about that one anyway, let's just go ahead and read it. 1 John 1, 9 to 2, 2. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, there's a hammer blow to the head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if we confess our sins... He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yeah, so first and foremost, our confession is directed in what direction? To God. So a few things in this passage that jump out to me, and then I'd love to hear if there's anything that jumps out to you as well, is first just the recognition that all of us are in the same boat. If you say you have no sin, you mm-hmm. deceive yourself. Right. Right? We're all there. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. And then the other thing that really jumps out to me is after he talks about confessing our sins to the faithful and just one who forgives, he says, and I'm writing these things to you, so that you may not sin. Right, as if. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think about a bit of the tension I feel, and I've had to explain with the conditional if. Mm-hmm. If we confess our sins, we will be forgiven and cleansed with the reality. But wait, if I'm in Christ, hasn't he forgiven all my sins? So like a mm-hmm. little bit of that tension mm-hmm. that I feel between mm-hmm. those two different concepts. And I don't know what the tenses are in this word confess, but it, to me in my life, it feels like an unending revolving door mm-hmm. of confession. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thrilled that God forgives me. I'm thrilled. But as soon as I get the words out, I've got 59 others that mm-hmm. I need to continue to confess. Yeah. And it feels very unending. The word confess actually means to say the same thing about. So when we are confessing our sins to God, we're not blame shifting. We're not rationalizing. We're not trying to self-justify. We are Agreeing? confessing our sin in a way that agrees with okay. how God sees that sin. Okay. Yeah. And Rasul, to the tension that you pointed out, I think the end of this passage that we just read helps with that. Hmm. So I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, maybe better translated, when we all sin, (laughs) we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins Mm -hmm. and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So there is that sense in which it's Christ's work. Yeah. What he's done that is what forgives. You know, one of the ways I've heard it explained is as it relates to our relationship with God. And the focus there is on the word cleanse. Mm-hmm. The story of a little boy dressed in his Sunday best to go to church on Sunday morning. Against his parents' instructions, he goes out and plays in the mud. And now he's covered in mud. And he realizes what he's done. And he goes to his parents and says, I'm so sorry that I disobeyed you. Because I played in the mud and you told me to stay clean. And the dad says, I accept your apology and I accept your confession, but I can't hug you until we clean you up. Mm. And there's Mm. a sense in which because sin does put a barrier between us and God, the cleansing in some way once again enables us to Mm. enter his presence. Yeah, but it's also he's the one that comes and does the cleansing. That's right. And I think that's an important part of this passage, too, is who are we bringing the confession to? A God who is like what? Father. Hmm. Father? What else? Just. Faithful and just. Faithful and just. So you have like faithfulness and justice Mm -hmm. being held at the same time. And then what is the primary way that the letter to 1 John describes God later in the letter? Love. He is love. It's his primary characteristic, his primary attribute. God is love. And we are his beloved. Yep. And so throughout this section, we think about confession and who we're bringing it to. We're bringing it to a God who is faithful and just, who cleanses us, who's our advocate, who is love, which just feels like the exact opposite of how I often was taught about confession and bringing sin to this holy, mighty God who wants to pour his wrath out on you because of how horrible and evil you are. And it's a good thing Jesus stepped in or God would have really took it to you. And there is a sense in which God is powerful and righteous and holy, of course. 
But the way God describes himself is as a God of mercy and compassion and loving kindness who comes to us and cleans us up. So what you're saying is that even though the Bible makes it clear that God is a God of wrath and has anger against sin, that wrath and anger has to be positioned within the context of his love. Yep. I think about the story we've looked at many times in Luke chapter 7 at the home of Simon the Pharisee and this sinful woman comes and anoints Jesus and Simon gets all bothered about it. And Jesus just says, you know, the one who's been forgiven much can yeah. love much. That paired with First John 1, 9 really changes, our, I think, our understanding. It equates forgiveness and love the way you're describing and Mm. therefore our our access to being loved in a different way. Yep. But that's only one piece of what confession is. So confession is confessing our sins to God who can do something about it. But there's also a sense in which confession includes making right the things and the people that we've wronged. Could someone read Numbers 5 verses 5 through 7 for us? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelites, when a man or a woman wrongs another, breaking faith with the Lord, that person incurs guilt and shall confess the sin that has been committed. The person shall make full restitution for the wrong, adding one fifth to it and giving it to the one who was wrong. Yeah. So first of all, who was the sin toward the person or God? God. It's always oh, first it's... toward God. Yeah. 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 What does the passage say? When a man or woman wrongs another breaking so, faith with the lord breaking faith with the so lord so which one both both so when we sin against each other there's a sense in which we're not just harming the person but mm-hmm. we're also dishonoring god or breaking faith with the lord well, which makes is me think of Zacchaeus how when jesus said you know you're forgiven he goes well i want to give back to these people mm-hmm. and these people and that's Make an interesting full restitution. formula full mm-hmm. restitution mm-hmm. for the wrong yeah so sometimes with we, interest mm-hmm. yeah that's right with interest sometimes with confession we talk about just make it right with god mm-hmm. but real confession is making it right with god there's a making things right with each other and then there's another aspect of confession which mm-hmm. is in James 5, verses 16 through 20. And in that one, it talks about specifically confessing our sins to who? One another. another. To one another in a church community. And what's the purpose of that? So you will be healed. Yeah, there seems to be a situation where the sin is at the root of some kind of physical ailment that the person's suffering. But until the sin problem's dealt with, physical healing can't come. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an aspect of which we're talking about spiritual and physical realities at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's a making things right with God. There's a making things right with each other. And then there's a sense in which there's a spiritual healing that we experience through going with confession. Because the truth is, is we can do restitution all day long, Mm -hmm. but does it ever actually make the thing completely right as if it never happened? No. Rarely, Mm -hmm. right? Like maybe financially, like, hey, I stole something. Here's more money back. It was quick. I got the money to you before anything happened. Okay, whatever, right? But for the most part, the types of things we're talking about that need confession are like real hurt between people. Yes. And so there's some aspect in which there's like a spiritual healing that happens as a result of confession. And that's really what I think confession is about is it's at its core is about healing and about restoration. And so confession actually includes dealing with sin and making things right and healing in relationships and with one another. And so that's, I think, a beautiful reason for us to practice confession and to lean into it intentionally, even though it's going to be really uncomfortable. Yeah, the spiritual practice of confession, another discipline, another habit that can have a really positive impact on our spiritual health and our relationship with God and with others as well. Exercising this spiritual muscle is an important part of our training in godliness. Well, Spiritual Habits and Training is the name of the study that Daniel and Elisa and Bill and Rasul are involved in. And in the last part of the conversation in that series, Daniel said he intentionally saved the habit that we'll talk about for that spot in the series. He thinks it's one that'll provide some needed balance to our two weeks of talking about exercises that we do, putting forth the effort in our spiritual training program. And if we're always doing, it tricks us to think that the only way this relationship with God works is if I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. that last spiritual discipline is more about something we don't do, 
All right, an exercise we don't do that gets us in better shape. <laughs> we'll wrap up our study called Spiritual Habits and Training uh, right after we look ahead to what our next podcast will be about. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Rasul is going to lead the group through a study called The Whole Man. He'll share some startling statistics with us about the state of men in our world today. And he's also asked a friend, Dr. Malik Blade, to join him in talking with the group about this as personally as they know how, from their experiences as black Christian men. There's a lot of brokenness around us in our world. So the Whole Man Project seeks to address this by speaking to these issues and specifically from the standpoint of black Christian men. But though it's coming from that cultural context, it's something that's relatable to all of us. Just like we look at the Hebrew scriptures come from a very Jewish context, but it's relatable and accessible to all of us. And so we're glad that you're at the table, Elisa. <laughs> well, I can't wait to learn. I'm sure I'm going to add a whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and as well, Daniel and Bill. The whole man, reflections for the head, heart, hands, and soul on the next Discover the Word podcast. And now let's listen as they talk about the uh, spiritual discipline, the spiritual practice that we do by not doing something. So we started this series talking about training in our spiritual lives, training in godliness, as Paul says. But what, what has stood out to you about the last two weeks of conversations related to training and discipline? One thing that stood out to me is that we're better at some than others. Mm-hmm. And mm. some have become very familiar friends yeah. in training and others are still kind of outliers and we're a little nervous about them and that I'm just speaking for myself you know I'm like going confession is still kind of tricky for me fasting is still kind of tricky for me prayer feels very familiar and welcome in my life I keep it on the shelf yep it's right there but there's a lot of others so I in other words I probably have some untrained undeveloped facets Mm -hmm. of my being what struck me through the conversations Daniel is that there were some of them that were quite expected I mean, mm-hmm. prayer, Bible reading, things of that nature. There were some that were a little surprising. Mm-hmm. Again, like friendship, yeah. not mm-hmm. as a thing, but as a discipline and things of that nature. So to me, it, it's kind of been a mixed bag of the familiar and the unfamiliar, as you were saying, mm-hmm. Elisa. Mm-hmm. And not only are some of them we better at than others, mm-hmm. But also some of them are more familiar to us than mm-hmm. others. And some of that, too, may depend on the, our tradition. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I think about First Timothy 4, 8, where we started for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think about how helpful the pictures that I get of this aspect of physical training is for the spiritual training. And yeah. one of them, even just having a personal trainer, right, which I just kind of started having uh, recently And one of the things that's really helpful is a personal trainer is able to see those things, Elisa, that you were saying that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Like I typically skip leg day. Like I'm like, I don't want to, you know, I don't like that. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, yeah, no, we're going to work on that. You know what I mean? You're going to work on the core, all this stuff that you don't like. And I think in the same way, spiritually, it's helpful to remember it is good to be well-rounded and not yeah. to just be one of those people that's like, oh, I'm just going to lift and just have like mm-hmm. a, a big upper body and like little twigs, you know, <laughs> underneath. Yep. It's like, you know, you have to be fully formed. Formed, and in the same way, spiritual training needs to be fully formed too. Yep. That's good. I also think it's important just to be reminded that we're not talking about earning salvation, trying to do these things to keep God happy, to make him love us more. Mm. These are all ways that we intentionally lean into the work that God is doing in us. And it is God's work that God does in God's timing and God's way. And we participate in that work through some of these practices. And so I want to talk about one more biblical practice that has been passed down to us throughout the history of the church and is probably one of the more surprising ones. Could someone read Psalm 62 verses 1 through 2? For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Silence as a practice. (laughs) And it's interesting, this particular example of silence is waiting in silence, or my soul waiting Mm -hmm. in silence. Those often go together, waiting and sitting with God and trusting God. But you're right, we live in a world that is as far away from silent as we could get. In Mm -hmm. fact, if I stop talking right now for a second, 
if you're listening to this on the radio or the podcast, our hearts beat and go, wait, something broke. <laughs> I better look real quick and make sure the volume was <laughs> right. still up or that somebody's not calling me and interrupting the feed or whatever. We don't like silence. We get uncomfortable with silence. One of the things that might be helpful as we think about this is when it comes to spiritual practices, there are practices that we do, right? And we often think about practices that way. So they're active. And we've talked about some of those. What are some of the active practices? Pray, we read our Bible, we fast. I mean, a lot of them. Yep, we confessing. Tithe, we yep, give generously. Mm-hmm. Yep. But with practices, there's not just active practices. There's also practices of inaction or abstinence is sometimes the term that we hear oh, in the church. I guess that would be fasting, yeah. So fasting would be going without. Mm-hmm. What other one did we talk about that's a, a lack of doing? Rest. Yeah, so rest, fasting, and silence. Also retreat can be a good example of this, which would be going away with God for a weekend mm-hmm. or for a night or for a few hours. And so there's things that we do, and then there's things that we intentionally go without. And why might that be an important type of practice? It's really important. We live in a very loud hurried world. Mm -hmm. Uh, I live in a city that (laughs) never sleeps where there's noise often. We can become so used to that, that we be even even become dependent on it. Mm -hmm. And I think about how oftentimes God speaks in a still small voice. Yeah. Finding a practice to catch up with myself, to catch up with God, to drown out all the hustle and bustle and to kind of be still and know that he is God is something that I think is really important. Yeah. And if we're always doing, it tricks us to think that the only way this relationship with God works is if I'm doing. Yeah. So if we don't do something as a practice, it's reminding us that our faith is about more than just what we do. It's about what God has done. Mm -hmm. And it's about receiving Mm -hmm from God, right? It's also important for us to have space where we can listen to God and receive from God. So I think more than anything, practices of abstinence or going without or inaction remind us of who's truly on the driver's seat of our lives and of our faith journeys, which is God, right? God is the one that does his work and his timing and his way, and we participate in it. Let's look at another spot where silence is mentioned as a practice. Could someone read Deuteronomy 27 verses 9 through 10? I got it. Then Moses and the Levitical priests spoke to all Israel, saying, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This very day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore, obey the Lord your God, observing his commandments and his statutes that I am commanding you today. That's pretty practical Mm -hmm. because you can only learn from listening to others. We here at this table, we learn from each other every time we get together and we benefit from each other. But I can only learn from you, Daniel, if I'm willing to be quiet and listen to you. So right now I'm talking. I'm not learning anything. I don't know if you are, but for people who are in public ministry, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a job requirement that you talk a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so being silent kind of goes against the grain of that occupational hazard you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think sometimes people that have very public facing mm-hmm. jobs, ministries, whatever, keeping silence, the practice of keeping silence may be one of the most important practices yeah. for them because then it reminds us that we receive from God. And it's out of receiving from God that we then stand in front of others, whether we're a sixth grade teacher <laughs> or a preacher or a mom who just always has kids in front of her, or someone who leads an organization and has all these employees that look to them. It's through keeping silence that we get to hear from God and then bring that to others. It's interesting. This is the first time in the Hebrew Bible where the invitation to hear from God comes after a command to be silent, Hmm. which I noticed in one of the commentaries that I was reading. And so, you know, we often uh, think about Deuteronomy, the beginning of Deuteronomy, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. But it's like, well, how can you hear unless, Bill, to your point, that's good. you keep silence first. And so quiet listening, concentration are important parts of walking with God too. So hopefully these two weeks have been helpful. I wanted to end with this particular practice because I think ultimately what we're practicing in all of these is just holding our hands open before God and trusting him to show up and to walk with us. 
And I think this is the best example of that, of just being silent. This is helpful to hear. Yeah. But those of us that may not have ever worked out this muscle uh-huh. in the training <laughs> regimen, what might it look like? Like, would you just like silent for how long? Silent yeah. in like what place? That's a great question because there's some really practical ways to get started. And one of the best ways is to get a timer and start with a minute. That's fine. A minute of silence or five minutes. There are Christian practices that are sitting in silence. It's called sitting in silent prayer. And it'll be like 20 minutes of just having a timer and sitting there, trusting that God's there and God can minister to us. But that is way too long for someone that has not started Mm -hmm. engaging silence. And the reason a timer is important is because if you don't have a timer, you just check the time the whole time. You don't actually get silent. (laughs) So give yourself permission to sit and to take a few deep breaths to focus on where you are in that moment. So feel the ground beneath your feet, feel yourself sit down into the chair that you're sitting in or if you're sitting on the floor. Close your eyes, take a few deep breaths and trust that God is with you. And that's really what all these practices are, trusting that God is at work in us and through us. And he invites us to participate in that work with him. Spiritual Habits and Training. That was a good series of conversations we've had over the last couple of episodes of Discover the Word. Daniel Ryan Day leading Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry in exploring how these different spiritual exercises, practices, disciplines, habits can form a training program for being more spiritually fit and can draw us into a closer relationship with God and with others. Uh, We, of course, haven't talked about all of the possible exercises, but I do hope that you'll become more convinced of the value of developing some spiritual habits. And remember that Reclaim Today, another aspect of Our Daily Bread Ministries that Daniel is part of, has a great section of their website with help and encouragement in this area. Go to reclaimtoday.org slash habits. They have a great section of their website on spiritual habits. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Well, here at Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries, it is our mission to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And when you give a financial gift, your donation provides the fuel that's needed to help us accomplish that mission. You can give when you go to our website at discovertheword.org. Look for the Donate tab. It's up at the top of the page. Discovertheword.org. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.